you're not here about advertising, you're in the wrong place. Anybody shows up for a <laughs> Well, no, it's real, realistically for our scenario, it's like, uh, it's like uh, half a penny for a bed. Um, my name's Josh. Uh, I work uh, for a newspaper group in Ohio and Kentucky. I'm the lead web programmer for their online operations and everything associated with that. I don't, uh, I don't sell ads myself, but I serve, construct, provide, track, manage, care, and feed for them. Um, and uh, that's about what I do. Um, part of the reason why we're doing this presentation is everybody pretty much wants to make money. That's, the, uh, that's sort of the word of the day. Everybody who's got a blog, they want to make money. Uh, the problem is, it's easy to say, it's very hard to do. Um, one of the important things that I'll mention right now is that at no point am I going to, in Zig Ziglar style, provide you with strategies for success for making your blog great. Um, if that's what you're here for, I'm sorry. Because uh, a lot of this is like bad news, uh, especially for bloggers. And that, and, and it's, it gets, it, that, and it's actually the best for bloggers and it gets worse from there. Um, especially when we get into uh, Twitter and Facebook and you know whatever else is out there, because I'm not sure we'll report things are going to We're part of that. Selling advertising is one and only one way of many to monetize content on the internet. It is generally a revenue strategy and not a business strategy. That's important because if you uh, if you want to do whatever you're doing as a business, as a business strategy, it's important to remember that revenue strategies and business strategies don't necessarily line up exactly. Um, selling advertising can be a business strategy, but most of the time it's a revenue strategy. And it's really only one way to do it. There are lots of ways to monetize social content. There are lots of people who do blogs and that kind of stuff to you know, to support their consulting operations, to push their, their book or their CDs or whatever. In MySpace, still frequently you see a lot of uh, music acts and things like that who are putting out content for free. Uh, Chris Anderson, who just wrote the book free, pushed his book on his blog and the ebook version and all that kind of stuff. You know, he makes money from selling the book, he doesn't necessarily make money off of it, directly off of those ads. If you yourself, participate in like a blogging federation or a newspaper or whatever, your income is very indirectly from advertising in general. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I didn't say this right at the beginning, so you know, and feel free to interrupt me. We'll do Q&A and then we'll talk about some of the examples that, uh, that I draw. And if I start talking too fast or stop making sense, stop me, because I may not know this. Um, why would you sell it? I mean, uh, a lot of stuff, especially with social networking, started out without any sort of monetization at all. You know, it's something that people did. Somebody liked something, somebody did something they were interested in, something that they, you know, scratched a personal itch for them. Um, but uh, but then after you do it for a while, sometimes you get costs. Um, one of the uh, one of the big one of the big reasons to sell ads is to provide content to people who don't necessarily have to pay the full price. This is the most common ad sales model as what newspapers and magazines and pretty much all traditional publishers who are ad supported do. They have a thing that is given out to somebody for a subsidized rate, and that subsidy comes directly from the sales of advertising. There's uh, also the connection your audience with the services. If you're in a really niche market, or you're in, uh, there's a lot of places where you see in, in uh, in high contract subcultures where they'll put out, you know, an annual holiday guide, and that guide will be filled with a certain kind of advertising, and that'll be the primary fundraiser for that social group. That book serves two purposes. Number one, it's the fundraiser, but number two, it connects people with information that they otherwise would not get. The internet has lowered a lot of barriers to communities forming and meeting other people like them. But those barriers still exist, and there are still things that, you know, if you're a, uh, a, a transgender knitting, um, you know, th there may be an internet group out there, but if you can find the holiday catalog for the transgender knitting community that has all these ads for all this stuff, that is a much faster and more effective way for you as a member of that community to connect with services and other people in that community. 
it's a good reason. It's a good, it's a good sales pitch too when you're trying to, uh, <coughs> to sell that to somebody. Um, to provide for the common good. To, um, this one is a little fuzzy because a lot of people think that they provide for the common good. I'm more talking about things for selling advertising in ways that, that uh, like PSAs, um, if there's a, you know, H1, you know, flu shots. Um, where are the flu shots? Who are the, the one example that I can use from our area is, I live in rural Ohio, a lot of Amish. Um, they mis they mix <coughs> mis mixed a batch of kerosene with a lot of gasoline, and the problem is that kerosene is used for lamps. And um, if you light a kerosene tainted a gasoline tainted kerosene lamp, it will explode. The principal people who purchase this kerosene for the lamps are Amish. Very difficult to get a hold of them. They don't have phones. You have to find somebody connected to the community who can tell them. Person. So they wide band ads everywhere. Just completely papered everywhere and everything. That's the kind of ad sales that, that you know that provides for the common good. Um, and the last thing is fan protection. <clears throat> if you have a board that puts that people post stuff for free, you need a lot of crap. The difference between one cent and free is a vast gulf that can keep out most people that are doing things in fairness. You uh, don't necessarily have to charge a lot, but a good example of this is uh, Stack Overflow, which is a technical website. They have job postings. If they just open it up to everybody, the job postings would be flooded with garbage and no one would use them. By charging, you limit the people who have access to people who really care that much. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but depending on the community that you serve, it can be huge. And some of that goes back to the connecting communities with goods and services. But a lot of times, you know, with these, you know, Craigslist is a, is a good example of if you charge just a little bit, you can make a decent amount of money and keep a lot of the garbage off, you know, scrap the garbage, um, without impacting your community in a, in a strictly negative way. That makes sense. Got it. Not it. Um, when? When should you sell that? This is uh, complicated quite a bit because when really is more about circumstances than about a specific time, unless you happen to also be a radio broadcaster or something like that. Um, and and that there's so there's two aspects of when we're going to talk about circumstances when you actually sell ads there's a whole temporal component of it that you know if your traffic peaks on Monday then perhaps Monday is a higher value position you can charge more for it versus Friday um, you know Google AdSense is a good example where it'll run ads all the time and is an ad displayed to someone at 4 a.m. as equally valuable as an ad that's displayed at, at noon or well, it depends. In terms of your community, if you are selling uh, insomnia-related products, then perhaps that late-night thing is, is really what you want. Um, if you're not, then perhaps not. But, but all of this is very context-centric. It complicates pricing models greatly and will often shy, make people shy away from certain kinds of things. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, but the, the biggest when is the first and first 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 when to sell advertising is when it won't get you into trouble. That is important because getting into trouble is sort of a broad thing. My closer job for this is Google News. You go to Google News and there are no ads on Google News. The reason why there are no ads on Google News is because the newspaper industry in general is a bunch of uh, vicious, litigious lights who if they felt that you were in any way profiting from them, they would send in the goons. Google knows this, and so they don't display any ads. They could make a lot of money for a brief period by posting ads on these sites. They don't, they probably never will until the, such time as the newspaper industry is completely dead, which may be sometime after next Tuesday. <laughs> um, but the, this is this is important. I mean, that, that is that uh, Pitt, I'm not from Pittsburgh originally, but um, the Pitt girl thing, you know, she she had a bunch of ads on there, and her situation may have been exacerbated by if people if people think you're profiteering, the the legal penalty penalties and and the legal realities there are much more pronounced. 
If you're just some person who's doing something and somebody gets mad at you, it's much more difficult for them to sue you. If you're some person who's doing something with a direct revenue tied to whatever thing that they think that you're doing, uh, all of a sudden, all kinds of legal remedies open up and, uh, and, and people with expensive suits and, and poor demeanors come around. And if you think that that may be an issue, that's something that I would generally recommend that you seek legal counsel. If you're small fry, um, there's several good universities here. Many of them have law schools. Many of those law schools have intellectual property and social media stuff. They are interested in working with this kind of stuff, or at least pointing you at somebody who might be able to help for a cost that doesn't cripple you. Um, but whenever, whenever you're in doubt, especially once you start selling advertising, a lot of the answers end with, but you should check a little over. Um, and that's no joke. Um, the, 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 I work in the newspaper industry. They love the laws. Love it. Um, it's good, good fun for them. Um, and if you don't live in that world, lawsuits can ruin your day in a major way. Uh, the next thing, the next, uh, the next when is when you have a sale of audience. You can, sale of audience is up for grabs. You know what's a sale of audience? The sale of audience is, some, is an audience that somebody wants to somebody wants to sell something to. Um, that could be five people. I know a guy in Columbus. Who runs a, uh, a board? Uh, it's a luthiery board, which is uh, guitar people who make guitars. And you know, there's this product called tone wood that's difficult to get, and luthiery people want it. And he sells tone wood ads and makes a pretty good uh, makes a pretty good markup on it. And his, his market is very small. There's not a lot of people making guitars by hand, sort of you know hobby shop style. Um, so he's got a sellable audience. Your saleable audience could be, um, like I said, anything that somebody wants to sell something to them. The, um, that's not the only time, though, because if you have a bunch of traffic, just pure traffic, just a stream of traffic, you don't necessarily have to have a quantifiable saleable audience at that point because you've got all this traffic, and there are people who, for whom traffic has some amount of value. Sellable audience generally is more valuable. The more stuff you know about the stuff, the people that are looking at you, the more valuable it is. But traffic is certainly, you know, if you got a ton of traffic, you can figure out sellable audience later. Um, and um, yeah, the, the traffic thing, I don't know, what's, uh, does anybody here have more than 20,000 units a day for their sites? 10,000? Five? One? Hundred. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. For for blogging stuff, this is a pretty common, pretty common situation. Some of that's a little bit changing. There's um, there are several non-mainstream media companies that are moving into a lot of media markets that are doing sort of paid blogging kind of stuff. Um, sorry. And uh, I think recently there was something about where you have paid bloggers to promote something. Yeah, they didn't make that disclosure, but they get paid some compensation. Yeah, and that that area right there is really fuzzy, and you know, there's a whole issue of a um, paid blogger. You got a T-shirt. Oh, actually, you paid for that one. The rest of right, I paid for this, but well, but what if I'm there's a jurisdictional issue there too? Because what if my Canadian citizen just happened to be here? You know, my committing my committing a, am I my not disclosing uh, on U.S. soil because of uh, you know. What if I'm running into a server in, uh, in Calgary or if I'm really what if I'm in Mexico? If you fail to respond, you can be a... Yeah, but the what you know, the reality is whether or not the State Department is gonna come crack down on some some random in, in Boston. They could sue you for unfair uh, business competition. They could, but in order to file a lawsuit it has to be into an appropriate jurisdiction. But the appropriate jurisdiction would be is where it was launched or where you were looking for your customers from. Is either theory to determine where you're going to be. Then the next question would be is the, the over you, and then the then that you give you a serve you to come and answer. And yeah, but, you know, I, but if I don't, this, this, uh, this right here is exactly why earlier I mentioned that a lot of answers end with, but you should consult a lawyer. And then they go ahead with the suit because you don't think they can do anything. And they say, well, you know that guy out there that says he. Going to take your collection of whatever you have it sold. He's real. <laughs> yeah. No. There, there's there's the 
the, uh, that particular statute is untested, and I strongly suspect that it's going to evaporate. Uh, maybe. That's but, but the point I'm making is that there's also unfair competition, appropriation of intellectual property, all sorts of other claims. But right. But once all or not, if you don't respond, there's no problem. Well, but once you get into an international uh, unfair appropriation of intellectual property, you're running into you're running into that other country state. What I'm saying is, you use the no, you use the uh, the test that you're broadcasting. You're you're setting it up so that it aims at American citizens, and that will be established by your pattern. Of, you know, what areas do you talk about? How do you use grand jury to establish that? Uh, you don't pursue. And nobody that is civil. You got civil problems. You got you got that. I mean, realistically, a civil problem is going to be a state. State, if you're lucky, it's state. It's not going to be federal. And an international citizen, I don't care about the state law. And what you care about is that state in the United States and the federal system. If the uh, party accusing you of something manages to get a judgment, no matter how they get it, it will follow you if they want it. Yeah, maybe. No, no, maybe. I mean, the, your, I, I, I would, I would recommend consulting uh, people that have actually had that happen. And um, my experience with dealing with people who had those judgments sitting against them is that it's generally not a problem. Um, it, eventually it might be. But again, if you have a conversation anything like this, you should be having it with a lawyer and not with some guy in podcast. Because <laughs> I can't defend <laughs> this. Um, uh, so, uh, did I cover on it when you want to? Oh, yeah, when you want to. When you want to sell ads. When you've decided that you want, to, you want to make some money off of this, whether it's a fractional amount, at least you can, you can slide that check across the table at Thanksgiving dinner and say, see, Uncle Bob, I am making money off the blog. <laughs> you know, go pound of salt. Here's five uh, bucks. Yeah, five <laughs> bucks right there. That's <laughs> it's happening. Well, not just a statement. Um, you don't get the check until it's 10 or 25 bucks. I, Yes. Um, the, the last time to sell advertising is when you have out of your track. The reason why I'm suggesting this is because if you act, um, some ads are very easy to sell, and then once you've sold them, you accidentally entered into this relationship with someone that has paid you for something, that they have all these expectations now. And if they come back around and say, hey, um, you know, my understanding was X and I was going to get these other things, and, and you didn't provide it, and now you paid me, and now you're defrauding me, or whatever. You can get into things that are at least uh, very uh, uh, corrosive to your relationship with whoever gave you that money, and you probably don't want to be there. So have a track. Google Analytics is free. It's pretty good. Um, I say it's pretty good because there's a lot of people who like Quantcast and Hunter and you know, any one of the myriad of other things out there. And Nielsen does them too. You know, I think Nielsen's numbers are kind of a joke. Um, lots of people who think Nielsen's are great think that Google Analytics numbers are kind of a joke. The print industry, uh, print and radio and, and TV that have dominated ad sales for so long have for so long lied about every aspect of their distribution and everything else that everyone who's in ad sales just automatically assumes that everyone is lying about everything. And the statistics sort of still reflect that underlying assumption of falsehood. So what I generally recommend to people is find a analytics tool that you like and stick with it. And when someone asks, you say, I use this tool, and here are the numbers that I use. And if they want to use something else, that's great, but this is the tool that you use. Cross-comparison between analytics tools leads to madness. Um, that's no joke. Um, they all count things slightly different. It's all, you know, don't do that. Um, but have adequate track. OK, so you know why. You know who you're selling. You know what you're doing. You know everything else. So how do you do it? Um, how many people here are salespeople, professionals? So three people. So you people probably know a lot of this. Um, the easy way is to sell ads online in most things. The easiest way is AdSense, uh, you know, Microsoft ads, Yahoo ads, AdMob, Ad 
walk a walk there are probably three that have come into existence since I started talking. There are probably four more that have waked out of existence since I started talking. Um, there's lots of places that will very easily put some JavaScript on your site or on your Twitter feed or on your whatever uh, into your videos, your pre-roll, post-roll, whatever. And they will run ads and they will pay you an amount for them. Generally, they operate under the, if you're a small operator, they generally operate under the principle that you should be happy that you're getting anything. And so they're, they're, not, um, they're not the most uh, sort of pleasant or open kind of things. You may get a check, you may not. Um, it's hard to tell. Um, that's the easiest way by far. It's also by far the, the least profitable in general. You can hire a salesperson. Hiring a salesperson is pretty easy. Uh, this, especially in this market, in this print market, uh, you can get all kinds of experienced online advertising salespeople who will work on commission. They'll do some stuff. If they're professionals who are experienced who are used to working in small groups, they may even be helpful. Um, I generally recommend talking to professional ad people and paying them money and, and entering into a business relationship with them if you're going to start this out because. Um, you're, you're going to learn a lot faster and a lot more efficiently and a lot more cheaply if you get to talk to somebody who has done these kind of things before and, uh, and you don't have to step on the same same potholes that they do. The other thing is sponsorship. And I'm throwing it on here because a lot of times sponsorship really can effectively short circuit the whole thing. If you do something locally and you are involved with some organization like a bar or a coffee shop or something, and they and you have events, the, the radio guys the other day were talking about the Snuggie thing. You know, they essentially got the Home Shopping Channel to sponsor their Snuggie crawl by sending them 100, 100 Pittsburgh Snuggies. That kind of stuff uh, frequently is, is pretty easy to do. Uh, it's often very rewarding, especially if you're working with the right you know, organizations that are aligned well with you. Um, if you can get them to sponsor, they've got the, the materials or cash or whatever. Um, I, I'll use Leo Laporte again. His This Week in Google podcast is always sponsored by somebody and he spends about five minutes talking up their services. Um, it's pretty easy to do. You don't have to have a lot of infrastructure. You don't have to have a lot of tracking. Generally, people who enter into sponsorship agreements are are usually more sophisticated and used to sort of the ephemeral part of it. They're not expecting a specific increase in traffic due to their sponsorship or whatever it is that you do. Sometimes you can get you know what amounts to charity sponsorship because some you know you you do uh, you know, Dick's Sporting Goods is big here and you do some kind of uh, at risk. Uh, youth running thing, and you want them to, to sponsor with some shoes or something. You know that they have probably have a budget for that. Um, you might be able to sit on to that. That that kind of sponsorship is effectively ad sales in the way of of getting into. How about the salesperson piece? Okay. So, where do you find people who do this? What is a good way to when? Would they be interested in talking with a blog? I mean, do they have? Yes, that's a, well. Yes, that depends. How's that for uh, um, the easiest way to find a salesperson is take out a classified ad. You take out a classified ad somewhere, and they will uh, you will get a lot. Of Where do you find a good, qualified, reputable salesperson? Um, usually, an agency. Okay. Uh, we get to that, but another way to do it is just through social networking. You know, there's Alpha Labs here. There's uh, PodCamp, which is this. There's all kinds of technology, startup, and uh, IT kind of stuff going on in town. There's a local network of people, you know, go to some other blog, you know, go to some blog that's local and say, hey, you know, who do you go through to sell your ads? Um, Cross-marketing with somebody else with a product that uses the same group of people you want to yeah. work together. So for me, one of the things I do from my aggregators are accountants and bookkeepers. Yeah, I mean, I don't compete with them in the least. I just supply more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, for somebody else in their space, when they get more money. Yeah, everybody likes getting more money. <laughs> um, and salespeople tend to be, um, you know, if you find a freelance salesperson who's got space in their dance card and they want manufacturer's reps. 
Hmm? Manufacturers reps. Yes. That visit your kind of customer. Okay. Certain markets are easier. If you're in pharmacology, bioinformatics, that kind of stuff, you know, you're going to be beating them off with a stick. If you're in, you know, transgender knitting, it's going to be a tough road to go. Um, Ironically, I have a GLBT blog, so you said that a little broader than knitting, but that's <laughs> what I do. No, um, if, if you were to do something that supported the uh, social, you know, people get together for social functions, if you were to do something, maybe create a common calendar, bringing those things together, that's a great way to uh, get your audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe send them out to work XYZ, hold them to that, and you determine if you met your problem. Problem with problem junk. Yeah. And your readership. Uh, uh, a lot of people, you know, if you're posting stuff, you have you have an audience. You might have salespeople, salesperson in your audience. Um, that are already familiar with the product, they're committed to it. It it helps a lot to have somebody who sells your product that believes in you. You can always you can always get a mercenary to do whatever you want, um, whether or not they are going to be aligned with you socially, politically, and spiritually is a different matter. Uh, that that you can't buy. But action can always be purchased. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the salespeople more in general because they are salespeople. Really, 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 really. If you, if you want to sell, you want to get to the point where you're where you're making a living off of anything. Really, anything that doesn't build. Even then, you're going to eventually need a, a salesperson. Um, the slightly more difficult ones are to purchase ads. This may seem somewhat counterintuitive, but especially in in niche markets and small markets and that kind of thing, to get people to get more people interested in you and what you do, and to get more advertisers aware of you, purchasing advertising is a very effective way to do it. It can be done somewhat cheaply. Um, you know, ad rates are falling all the time. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, would I recommend taking on a TV slot? Probably not. Radio, uh, you can do a lot of different things with radio, with public radio and sponsorship, with um, with the other thing. Another thing you can do is the, the dirty truth about newspapers is that they're generally understaffed and busy, and if you can get them some reason to write a story about you, they might. They might. Um, and then you don't even have to buy the advertising you've dealt with on that. Uh, especially if you're doing something interesting or strange or funny or, or um, that gets protesters involved by those protesters. Um, but um, the next thing is agencies, which agencies are a special case of salesmen. Agencies do stuff, add stuff, create stuff. They do all kinds of stuff. Some of it, um, you know, agencies. Uh, get and deserve a bad rap in general. I'm on the print production side, so agencies, I try to stay away from them and wash my hands a lot whenever I talk to them, but they think the same thing about me, so. Um, but there are a lot of agencies in town. If you find one that's, again, aligned with you socially, spiritually, culturally, um, and talk to them about things, they probably have done something similar to what you're doing and can talk to you about it reasonably. Um, there's also the schools, the business schools, uh, business schools generally, there are business students who have a need of doing certain things, marketing activities and whatnot. If you can catch their interest, if they're already a member of your audience, that helps hugely. Um, and you can you can you can do that and get them to to sell and promote and to and to do things. And you can sell them yourself. If five after five, you can buy information. Info USA, Axiom will sell you something called firmographic information, which is company size, phone number, contact person, annual sales, all that kind of stuff. If you can get that into an Excel spreadsheet and you can spend an hour a day calling down that list and calling people and selling that. Well, Matt, um, have you seen the video that Gary Vaynerchuk did where, I don't know if he knows, he's a wine guy, and he just did, um, theoretically, he said, what if I was going to start a company that sells beer glasses? Mm -hmm. So I know Google, he typed in beer glasses, Saw the ads on the side, go, okay, these people want to spend money on this. Clicked on one, called the guy, said, hey, I'm doing this, would you like to talk? And he did it on speakerphone, it was very uh, very productive. So, you know, if you find ads of people advertising for the thing you want to sell ads for, 
you probably want to sell ads because they're selling an ad. So. Yeah. And that, especially in niche markets, I would I would generally recommend not um, if you're if you're doing this now, I would recommend revisiting it, not treating everyone else in your space as a competitor. Um, if you're in a niche market like that, you know, you call them up, hey, what are you doing? They might hang up on you, they might say, Yeah, no, it's been a real bear. Uh, you know, the, well no, he was he was calling in the Google AdWords, he called the company that was advertising through AdWords for their customized beer glasses. So they were they were a producer right, so from the product. Somebody else who's doing it and selling oh, ads. Right, right, right. Call them up. Talk to them. They might have an agency who's really cheap and they love. Um, you may not be direct in front of it. But especially in niche markets, the more people who know about your niche, the better. So yeah, absolutely. Call them up. Direct competitors on certain products will cooperate. Yeah. I, I used to deal with electronics uh, distributor in Pittsburgh. We used to cooperate in certain product lines with the two other co direct competitors. We'd even do it to the point of exchanging stock. We have problems when we didn't have it to keep our customers rather than seeing the <coughs> brand. Yeah, the, the selling yourself is completely viable. Because selling yourself is the cheapest because it's just your time. So whatever you value your time at, you know, and there's a lot of things you can do there. Questions on that? I see you. No, that's great. Uh, <laughs> the difficult ways. The difficult ways are to hire and add sales staff. Um, unless you are currently in management and are experienced in forming these kind of entities, I would recommend not doing that. If you are, then you probably already know when you're going to be fine. Um, agencies are also the difficult side. Agencies, um, because agencies are not monolithic. So there's not a single agency. There are many, many agencies. Some agencies are better than others. Some are easier to deal with. Some are going to rob you. Some aren't. They're people just like the rest of us. Um, and selling them yourself. Because unless you're a current sort of salesperson, you're going to learn a lot of things that are difficult and, and selling things is hard. If selling things were easy, um, the play would not have been built at the sales. <laughs> something else. Um, and uh, okay. So we're going to do a quick digression for people who may not be familiar with these terms. Um, Ads online are generally sold through one of these ways. CPM, which is cost per thousand, because M is the, is the uh, Roman numeral for a thousand, um, which is the cost of the ads per thousand impressions. CPC is the cost per click, which is the cost for every ad that gets clicked on, regardless of how many times it was shown. CPL is cost per lead. You don't run into cost per lead in a lot of places. Autos, you do. Cost per lead is Every person who shows up who says or, or is algorithmically demonstrable to be tied back to you, you get some sort of reward. Uh, Adicio is a big auto sales person. They have a cost per lead model, where if the person who calls a dealer comes through your Adicio portal, you get uh, some money. Cost per lead tends to be really, really high rates because it's really infrequent. You know, For cars, cars are great right until about October of 2008, and then it ran out of club. Um, that happens a lot, not just in global economic meltdowns, but, but it just happens. Uh, cost per action is a cost for, you know, where uh, Amazon affiliate system is essentially a cost per action advertising model. You know, you get a cut of whatever they sell. Uh, cost per action is very difficult to sell and very difficult to buy, and it's sort of a strange place to be in. Um, because it it's, can be very complicated. Uh, a lot of these can be very complicated. ECPM is one of my least favorite because it tends to be extremely complicated, which is the effective cost per thousand, which is often calculates in view-throughs and things like that, um, which, and the next one is the view-through rate. And a lot of pricing models for view-through rates require calculus. In my opinion, if you have a pricing model that requires calculus, you're doing derivatives. Um, you know, if your if your rate card requires higher math, you might want to rethink that. But view through rates in ECPM, they do it all the time, and and a lot of especially national buys will come in with these kind of pricing. Um, and the, you know, you're probably never going to need that in the you know in the 
If you do, you know. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, run a site, which is just an ad that runs on everything. Uh, leaderboards, you know, for a lot of, again, for a lot of niche sort of community-oriented products, a lot of times run a site's a good value because you can price it at a level that's going to be sellable, and you, you don't want to get into a huge amount of inventory anyway. So, you know, it's there. You don't need, you're going to run a run a site ad. You don't need an ad server. You don't need a lot of things that you need for some of these other things. Page peels, pop up, pop under. Uh, everybody knows what those are, right? The, the really annoying yeah. flippy ads and things that pop up and pop under. Um, Pre-roll and post-roll generally are only for audio and video. Um, these can be very effective. Uh, Pre-roll video, uh, pre-roll post-roll video ads and for audio stuff can be very effective. They're easy to do. They're not very annoying. Um, they're generally sort of, they're unobtrusive. People like them. It's a good slot. It gets a lot of eyeballs. Um, brought to you by, which is the sponsorship thing. Um, Facebook has their own ad serving engine now that doesn't really fall into any of these kind of things. And um, the jury's way out on Facebook ads. Twitter ads seem to only be spammers right now. Um, and, uh, and it would be interesting to see how that, that's playing out right now, actually. Um, and will probably continue to. Um, and co-sponsoring crosswinking, which is you sell links co-sponsoring to someone else. You know, your, uh, the uh, transgender knitting blog gets a co-sponsorship from a wool man for an organic wool manufacturer for spinning your own yarn, and you have that uh, that that thing. Um, the things to keep in mind when you're selling ads is what your inventory is. The inventory is important because it, that's how many ad slots that you have total. If you have a page that has three ad slots and you get 10,000 hits on that page a day, you have 30,000 ad positions that are saleable. Um, that is an enormous amount of inventory if you only get 100 hits a day. Um, so, well, I guess you couldn't do that. But anyway, I think I, you, you have to be mindful of your inventory also because that helps you set your price. You know, if you've got a ton of inventory and somebody comes in with a low ball bid, if the marginal cost approaches zero. If you're, already, if you're already serving ads, the marginal cost to you to serve more ads goes to zero, which is part of the pricing pressure on a lot of this stuff. Is that a lot of people have so much inventory that you can put ads everywhere. There are remnant providers um, who inject ads into it to run it, and the pricing on that is very low. Um, how many slots per page? What is one visitor to your site worth? And how do you want to calculate the visitor? You know, Google thinks their visitor is worth about 50 bucks, which is astronomical compared to what most people. I mean, I have daily non-metro newspaper for us. One visitor is worth, I think, about 400 bucks a year. So over there, you know, it's like less than a nickel. Over what does it mean? If you had to sell your visitor in a, in a, in a, in a marketplace somewhere. What is their what is their presence worth? If you were to sell it to someone else, well, it's like quality of your audience. Are, are, are you saying like touch value of the customer? No, I'm saying what is the instantaneous value of the customer? So as soon as they come, what's their value? Like, what's that value? So you to, to your clients or to you? To to you, to you as the entity. This was sort of a hard one. So um, if they were there. If they weren't there, how much would it? How much would you subtract? So if you have a hundred regular readers and a million non-regular readers, there's some there's some page view that's worth something to you. For if it's a page view or a listen or something, um, a lot of times people do them in annual because uh, it's easier to do the math. Because when you get into sub sub pennies, do, do you mean that you have a hundred visitors made five bucks that they're worth five cents a piece? Yes. If you had 100 visitors in a year, you make five bucks. So maybe they would be sessions where people came in, where they came into your site, they did something, and they left. That will be that will be one visitor, even if they repeat it, right? Yes. So the, the, the problem business. though is it gets into um, it's like what's busy. It's like travelers on the airplane, right? more than we have actually. Kind of, except in a lot of social media stuff, the travel on the airplane metaphor begins to break down. 
and what's our length worth? What's the, the one one good way to uh, to to check this value is that um, Burger King offered you a free Whopper if you would defriend five people from Facebook. It's like the value of one of this, which put the value of one friend on Facebook worth one fifth of a Whopper. <laughs> so if you had a hundred friends, you had twenty Whoppers of value. Were they right or left handed? Uh, well, I don't know that it particularly matters for this contest, but it might matter. Not with the Whoppers. Um, so that is the value of a visitor there. On other pages and other kinds of things, the main thing, the main reason to keep this in mind is because it helps you set your rates. Because eventually somebody's going to ask, what's this going to cost me? And if you stop and stare at them and go, ah, then you, you, know, you, lose, you lose money every moment you, you, uh, you stare at them. Understand why you're selling ads in the first place, and uh, understand what your goals are for selling ads. Um, here's, I'm going to show two examples. One is sort of ridiculous, and one is, is not very ridiculous. This uh, presentation will be available online, so you don't have to, to read the text. But you have 20,000 unique visitors a day with 100,000 page views, and you have 10 ads sold with three ad slots per page, and a run of site. Uh, you have a leaderboard, which is 500 bucks a month. And one ad with a cost per click of a dollar per click, which is which is really high. And, and this particular ad gets 25% of the people that see it click on it, which is really high. Which is astronomical. Um, your gross revenue would be $5,800 a day. Um, these numbers are very very high. The re the reason why I'm showing this one first is this is essentially ridiculous. The reason why I'm showing it first is that, unfortunately, this is what a lot of people in their head think. Because you have to, a lot of times they think, well, you know, TechCrunch makes $10 million, so if I could just make 1% of that, I'd make $100,000 a year. Well, the, probably not. Um, a more reasonable example is you have 200 uniques and 1,000 page views a day. Um, you have the same same stuff, and, and your your revenue is seventy five bucks a day. Half of that is that five hundred dollar a month. Um, so, and that's a run site, just a just a post up there. Um, this, you know, probably going to pay rent. Um, and that's if you you know selling ten ads to people. With a, with a CPM of 250 and a leaderboard for 500 bucks and a CPC like that, that's a lot of work. Um, Hence the salesperson. Yes. They're going to take a cut of that. Um, you download this presentation here. After I'm done here, I'll upload it. Does anybody have like somewhere central where they go to sort of get an idea on how much you charge for ads? Like, I just do reader work has time. Yes. OpenX Marketplace is probably the easiest place to do that. OpenX is an ad server. They have a thing called Marketplace where people auction off ad space and that kind of stuff. So you got an idea of how right. There's a company called MediaSpan that does a lot of remnant advertising and they're pretty easy to work with. Uh, you just Google MediaSpan ad sales and call them up basically. And a lot of this stuff is, is old school, like call somebody up who's, who's probably wearing a lot of gold and doing that. that. Um, you know. Like Tom Cruise. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Tom Cruise. So yeah, expect to be on the phone. I was gonna say for, for my other company, I'm just kind of playing around with Facebook ads, I'm just learning. And it's kind of neat. I mean, you go in there and just sign up and put in who your demo is, exactly who you want to reach, and then how much you bid on. I've been doing the cost of click, and you bid on it, and what kind of like software I keep wanting to change my bid. Imagine you know, eighty five clicking that clicks through to our site. Hands, yeah, I'm about to go to today. I just planned for now. So we have had people come in to our store that you know never heard of us and find out. So it's pretty cheap budget to take for everything. Well, I'm just trying to clicks, but I mean, I have a person who's actually selling before too. But I was targeting college students and taking them off fish. Sell not yeah. <laughs> to me right now, I'm just using like a play budget to mm -hmm. see, but it's but to me it's fascinating. So I usually do TV and radio print. I spend a lot of money. It's 
place is incredibly cheap to get a target audience. I mean, and understandable. Yeah. There's a lot of great cards. You look at them, your eyes roll back in your head and fall over. Like Facebook's going to make you crazy. Crazy. I mean, I'm pulling all the way. There's a graphic dead and everything. And it's just, I think it's fascinating compared to what I pay and what I do in the other media. It's much more responsible. Yeah, and you can see that that the Facebook ad market in particular is, is highly volatile. It's nowhere near the kind of uh, stability that you see in a lot of kind of places. People are still trying to figure out. Right, honestly, I'm going to say this stuff. I'm going to figure out what you make a lot more. Yeah. Uh, did you have another question? Or any other questions? Questions? Comments? Uh -oh. This goes back more on the tracking and stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, we get asked all the time, what's your click through rate? What's, what, what is a good click through rate? What can you expect from your site to be a click through rate? There's no real answer out there. Uh, what do you track before you sell? We do, but you know, it's kind of like different. It depends on we have a specific audience, and if you know, if my audience is looking for XYZ, but if, you know, if an advertiser wants to buy, I'm not going to say no to them. And our advertising doesn't really match up with our audience, then the click through rate is really low. And so then you get a really weird, you get a 4% click through rate on here and a 0.01% click through rate on the other side. And, and that's something I would, that, that if, if I were going to do that, I would try to manage their expectations early on and say, look, you know, the, the reality is you don't meet up. You know, your product doesn't really meet up with our services, so you, your value is going to be kind of low. Um, you can try to change that ad so that it is. You can try to, to, to well, alter the services. Well, I'm just doing it for the exposure. And I think they understand it. But once in a while, you know, the next person you have to do is oh, we have a great click through rate of 4%. And you can't expect that for, you know, really dry parking garage on the street. Buying an ad versus really expensive penny with buying it. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and some of that you can mitigate by pricing. You can say, you know what, I'm looking at your thing. I don't think your click through rate's going to be very good. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell you a run of site ad that's going to run you know, with this percentage of sites, and it's going to be a flat fee. And uh, we're going to put a, a call to action on it or something. And if somebody comes in and they, they say that, then you know your ad is working. And if not, then we then we call it. But that's the kind of stuff that a, that a professional salesperson or an agency is going to, uh, going to, but not that, I don't know what you do, but I mean, somebody who does internet sales, who, who does this kind of thing, who's, is going to be able to, to work with them to say, you know, if you're expecting, you know, if you're expecting a 25% click through on your, your Christian day camp, um, you know, on my on my my Wiccan atheist, you know, anarchist site. <laughs> I got news for you. You know, it's not gonna happen. And I'll take your money, but um, you know, we should we should set that expectation. Just a comment on that. I think um, for us, the problem is the people who are servicing these ads versus the people who are selling these ads, and the learning curve is a little off. <laughs> You had mentioned uh, three sites sort of looking at for analytics. There were Google, I'm sure, and who? Quantcast. Uh, Quantcast. Quant? Quant? Quantcast. Like so you made it too. Yeah. I've heard that Quantcast is good for like very short, like every minute. It's like very good. It's not very good for long term. And I've heard Google Analytics is good for long term, but if you wanted to see who clicked through this particular minute, it's not particularly good for that. Yeah. And the analytics be used together? Yeah. Quantcast is also really good for um, for for uh, demographics. You know, I want to know I want to know how many 38 year old white males hit this site on Tuesday. Will you put all the things you told us in your presentation? I will attempt to put them all in. If, you, if there's something in there that you think I forgot, email me and I will I will respond. Would you have, you have, I think it would be one more question. I've seen like a general comment like someone who's a company that advertises 30 years and it's changed a lot. I think the biggest thing is just the integrity and honesty of your clients. And if you know you're not going to talk them out, then you should be networking and send them to someone who can because that's how you build your base. It's that simple. Well, they they need to be helped, so they sent it somewhere that didn't, and that helped me. And then they'll say you're great. And so I mean, I'm just certain people are like, how's it starting to be all the way? Yeah. That's really scumbags. 
I think that is very important, especially in niche markets, because there aren't going to be very many people in that space. And if you alienate them all, all two of them, you may be very lonely. So, thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.